Um, the following PowerPoints are for the land and water objectives that you can find on Edline. If you are reading along in your Princeton Review book, it's in Chapter 7, so you can also read that and do some practice questions. Okay, so number one says to define the Green Revolution and list two positive and negative impacts of the Green Revolution. So here's your definition. Um, if you remember, we talked about the Green Revolution um, in our agriculture chapter, and we said it's the use of modern machines, modern machines and techniques to yield more food per acre along with higher varieties. So you probably remember I told you that the father of the Green Revolution was Norman Borlaug. He was a U.S. scientist credited with beginning the Green Revolution. Um, and he's also credited with saving one billion people from starvation. Um, he worked in Mexico and he introduced short stem miracle wheat to Mexico and other countries. Um, and so because of the Green Revolution, now we have enough food to basically feed most people on Earth. Obviously there are people living in areas um, that don't have access to food, but we do produce a lot of food on Earth today. Um, the positives of this, the reason why it's obviously a good thing, I just stated it, um, because now we're able to feed more people and we have higher yielding crops. Um, and along with this, we use heavy machinery. Um, so you could also talk about some negative impacts on the environment. Um, the more fossil fuels that we're using, the more greenhouse gases we're putting into the atmosphere, the more oil um, we're requiring for the use of these uh, machines as well as producing pesticides and fertilizers. So overall, it's a positive thing, but it cannot have some negative impacts to our environment. Um, some critics have said that it causes developing countries to now be um, dependent on highly developed countries. So that is your green revolution and on the screen you can see that the rice plant here and you can see that originally we had that tall conventional rice plant. Um, it was crossed with uh, higher yielding smaller rice plants to give us the best rice plant that we, uh, that we have, so the superior rice plant. Number two says to define sustainable agriculture, drip irrigation, um, intercropping, and crop rotation. So we've talked about sustainability all year long, and basically sustainable or sustainability means that um, we want to make sure that future generations have access to the soil, the land, everything that we use today. So we need to use things in moderation. Um, and so drip irrigation you can see on the screen, it's also known as trickle irrigation, either one. Um, this is when we are using water sustainably in our farming techniques. So you can see that we have a, a hose here um, that has some holes that are releasing the water through the root zone of the crop. Um, and this is beneficial because we have less evaporation of the water. So when we use a regular sprinkler, it sprays the water directly into the atmosphere. And by doing that, um, it's going to cause the water to evaporate. So instead, if we do something along these lines with drip or trickle irrigation, um, we're going to reduce evaporation and we're going to make sure that water is making its way to the root zone. So um, that's what that is. We have intercropping, which I guess I don't have a slide for, but it's basically when you alternate rows of different plants. Um, maybe it's on the next slide. Let's see here. Oh, here we go. Intercropping, I'll go back to uh, crop rotation, but intercropping, we have, you can see here, two different um, rows of, of crops. And the benefit of this, well, there are many benefits, but um, it keeps the soil nutrient rich. So it's considered sustainable because now the these two crops, I would, I would purposely pick two crops that take different nutrients out of the soil. Um, they're not going to deplete the soil of one type of nutrient. And also you could pick crops that have different varying depths of the root. So um, maybe one crop is able to go deeper in the root and therefore it's gonna take the minerals and nutrients from that layer versus the other crop has shallower roots and it would take it from a, a higher layer. So intercropping, um, it's when you have alternate rows of crops. Going back to crop rotation, we've talked about crop rotation a lot, I feel like this year. So this is the, the same uh, slide that I show you over and over and again, again for crop rotation. Um, so there are multiple benefits of crop rotation. We can talk about it 
in terms of keeping the soil nutrient rich, but recently we've, we've, we've discussed it as far as reducing pesticides um, and helping to, to reduce pests on, on a farm. So with crop rotation, you can see first year, maybe we grow some corn. We change it up to soybeans the next year. Um, we want to be very specific about the types of crops that we're changing it up to because um, you want to make sure, again, that you're keeping the soil nutrient rich. So you want to pick a crop that takes a different nutrient out of the soil. And soybeans happen to be legumes. And if you think back to the nitrogen cycle, um, these legumes have nitrogen-fixing bacteria that live in and around the roots. And so soybeans are actually very good because they, they put nitrogen into the soil. So you change it up the next year to maybe oats. So maybe oats use a lot of the nitrogen out of the soil. And then you change it again to alfalfa. And so basically you change up the crop from season to season or year to year. Um, and it keeps the soil nutrient rich. And we also said that it helps to reduce pests on a farm because each crop is going to attract a different pest. So um, you're going to purposely pick crops that are going to attract a different pest so one type of pest doesn't build up in large amounts. Um, number three says to define the tragedy of the commons. Um, we talked about this, I think, week one. You guys got to read an awesome article on tragedy of the commons. Um, but this gentleman right here, his name is Garrett Hardin, and he is the one who wrote that amazing article. Um, and tragedy of the commons is basically a theory um, where individuals will act in their own self-interest. So everything that we've talked about all year, really, in environmental science, you could relate to tragedy of the commons um, because we're really all selfish and we are going to use our resources and pollute the environment because it's going to benefit us. So I've said before many times, um, in the United States, we are going to drive our cars and we're going to not carpool and not take public transportation and we're going to pollute the atmosphere and um, the people who are going to have to deal with this are the people who are living in Bangladesh where the water level is rising, the sea level is rising and they're going to have to get up and, and move at some point. So it, this is all for our own like um, self-interest because it's easier for us to drive than it would be to take public transportation or to carpool. And if you think back even further, this also relates to external costs and negative externalities. Um, so here's your definition, so you can write it down. Um, and some examples of a commons you can see up here. You could say the ocean, air, water, an uh, animals, minerals, national forests, fish, anything that is really free, anything that everybody has access to. So that is, that's going to be the commons there. Okay. Your next question, number four, says to define land reclamation. Really simple. Um, I don't even have a slide for that. So re land reclamation just means to restore the land to its original state. Um, I think if you remember back, you saw a picture and a slide um, of the University of Wisconsin. It was actually an example of an in situ um, reclamation and it was an area that had been degraded um, from farming and so it was reclaimed into a grass prairie. So it's just changing an area of land that's been degraded into something that is usable and new. Okay, so number five, it says to describe and define methods employed to manage and harvest trees. So we went through the four ways of managing trees. I think you guys drew me some really pretty pictures. Um, and we have four main ways. Truly, you're going to see on the AP exam something probably about clear cutting because clear cutting is, is the most common practice and it's the worst for the environment. So if you're thinking, okay, environmental science, probably going to see something that's harmful to the environment. Um, clear cutting, if you remember, is the removal of all of the trees in an area. And it's the worst for the environment. Um, if you look down here, you can see it leads to desertification, so like desert-like conditions. Um, and basically, we have loss of habitat. Um, but it's the best for a timber company because they're able to extract lots of trees at one time versus the other methods. Um, some of the other methods that we did discuss, kind of going backwards, backwards here, 
seed tree cutting. If you look at this, um, this is when you, a timber company would go into an area or a forest and basically remove um, almost all of the trees, just leaving a few of the trees to regenerate the forest by, by leaving their seeds. So just a couple of trees are left here. We have shelter wood cutting. The special thing about this um, is that this happens over time. And you can see I wrote on top here uneven aged trees, even though you can't read my handwriting, but it, uneven aged trees. So we have um, some older mature trees, then we have some young trees. It's called shelter wood because the older trees are there to shelter the younger trees. Um, and a timber company would come in year one and remove all the trees that are just economically not worth it. So they're going to remove the trees that they can't even do anything with just to, to make the forest um, grow that, the way that they want it to. Ten years later, decade later, they come in and the trees that um, they had left behind have now matured and grown and they're going to remove those mature tall trees and allow the younger trees to grow and eventually their seeds will um, regenerate the forest and then this is this process is going to go on for decades so this is over time and you'll see the keyword uneven age trees and then selective cutting is the least profitable profitable for a timber company this is when you have um, a timber company that basically leaves the, the forest intact and they only remove mature trees from time to time. So obviously if you own a company you're not going to want to do this because it's going to take a lot of energy and time for you to go into a forest and remove just a few trees. So this one is not uh, practiced very often but obviously it would be, be the best for the environment. Okay. Um, number six, number six, number six, number six, it says to define habitat fragmentation and its effect on biodiversity. All right, habitat fragmentation. So I'll tell you about that one since there's no slide. Um, we talked about habitat fragmentation, which is when we are going to break up a species habitat. Um, I've talked about um, Alligator Alley. That's an example of breaking up a habitat. So um, Alligator Alley runs directly through the Everglades, um, Panther Wildlife Refuge, and obviously this is home to a lot of different organisms um, and some of them that are endangered. So fragmentation means that you're breaking up an organism's habitat and um, obviously it's going to have a negative effect and it's going to decline biodiversity. So if two Florida panthers um, can't find each other to mate because there's so few of them because their habitat's fragmented, they're not going to be able to reproduce obviously and then over time we'll see a decline in, in those numbers. Um, your next one. So it says to Describe how the lack of genetic diversity impacts the production of crops. So this is pretty easy. Um, all you really need to understand is that a lot of our farms are monocultures. And remember that monocultures mean that means that we grow one type of crop. And because there's low genetic diversity, um, we're going to have our crops more likely to be susceptible to, to disease and to pests. So because we have one type of crop, it's more likely that, that there'll be some type of plant disease that can wipe everything out um, or one type of pest that can, that can also eat up most of our plants. And that kind of leads us to um, the pesticide treadmill here. And I feel like I may have skipped a couple of slides. Let's see. So, I'll go to, oh, here we are, loss of habitat. So this actually, my slides are out of order, I apologize, is the answer to number six. So here is a picture of an area being fragmented. Don't forget the number one um, reason why animals are endangered and go extinct is due to loss of habitat. Um, and it's anthropogenic causes, meaning uh, human-induced causes. Oh, and here is the next answer. So this is actually number seven. Describe how the lack of genetic diversity impacts the production of crops. 
Um, obviously, like I just said, if we have monocultures, which, which most, most of our farms are, it's going to increase the probability of the spread of a disease. You can see the potato blight in the top right hand corner. Bottom left corner, we have some Russian aphids. So when we have monocultures, which is very low genetic diversity, um, there's a great chance that our crops are going to be eaten um, or killed in some manner. All right, this is number eight. So number eight says to differentiate between national parks, national wildlife refuges, national forests, and national wilderness areas. So we're just going to quickly go through these. Um, don't forget that these are all federally owned land. So we have our federally owned land versus our private lands. Remember that most of the land in the United States is privately owned. Um, so we'll look at first national parks. Um, don't forget national parks are set aside for recreation. So the whole point of a national park is for humans to be able to go there. We pay an entrance fee and we are hanging out in nature. That's the whole point there. So limited development, you're allowed to camp, hike, fish, um, you're allowed to be in a national park. And here you can see some, some pictures of national parks um, overseen by the National Park Service. Um, and don't forget your first national park was Yellowstone National Park. National Wildlife Refuge areas, these are managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and this is land, lands managed for conservation of fish, wildlife, and plants. So it's a little bit different than a national park in that many of these wildlife refuge um, these areas were set aside for a specific animal. So we have um, the Panther Wildlife Refuge. Pelican Island was the first wildlife refuge in 1903. It's off the coast of Jacksonville. So many times you hear National Wildlife Refuge like for a specific animal or for a plant. Um, and you can also go there um, and um, they can be used for recreation as well, like Loxahatchee Wildlife Refuge. Your national forest, you can see on the map here where your national forests are located in the dark green. Um, they are managed by the U.S. Forest Service, and um, these are used for multiple reasons. So they can be used for recreation, they can be used um, for timber, we can mine for minerals in national uh, forests. So they have multiple uses. Um, and you can notice here a big like key thing is that there most of our um, federally owned land and forests are in the 11 western states and also in Alaska. So that's where we have most of our nationally or federally owned land. And then the wilderness area. So this is like the special one because um, it's a little different than the other ones. The other ones you're able to go and and um, have spend time in them. So, and you can in the wilderness as well. So the thing about the wilderness is that it is given the highest federal protection of any of the federally owned land. And you can see here it's land completely set aside, no development permitted. So if you go into a wilderness area, which these can be found inside of national parks, inside of national forests, um, if you go to a wilderness area, there are no roads. Um, people do hike through wilderness areas and really humans are, are just like passing through. This is really areas that are set aside for nature and for organisms, almost as if humans were not here. Um, but we do go through wilderness areas. So um, it is a place where people will hike through a wilderness. Um, can be inside the National Park, National Forest, National Wildlife Refuges. Um, and it's overseen depending on where it's located. So like I, like I just said, if it's in a national park, then, then, then the National Park Service will oversee it. And if the wilderness area is in a national forest, then the U.S. Forest Service will oversee it. Um, and if it's in the wildlife refuge, then the Fish and Wildlife Service will oversee it. And generally, um, the Bureau of Land Management, they're in charge of all federally owned land. So they kind of have a little like stake in all of these pieces of land. They kind of help oversee all of them along with their each individual's um, um, specific uh, groups. Okay. Um, pesticide treadmill. I know I am going out of order and I apologize. I am so sorry. All right. So here's our pesticide treadmill. We just talked about this. Um, so this is something that happens. It's created because of the pesticide use and it's due to 
evolution of genetic resistance. So it's really a term to indicate a situation where farmers need to use more and more of a pesticide because of resistance. And so it's known as the pesticide treadmill. So if you look here, we have our farm here and we're applying our pesticide to the farm. And um, what's happening is that it's going to kill most of the pests, but then we talked about resistance. Some of these insects are going to be resistant to the pesticide. Those um, insects or pests that are resistant, they're going to reproduce. Their numbers are going to increase. And then we're going to have a new population that's genetically resistant. And then we're going to increase the pesticides. And so this is going to happen again. And maybe if we don't increase, then we're going to change up to a different type of pesticide. So this is known as a pesticide treadmill because it's um, similar to the belt on a treadmill. You're just going around in circles, and you're trying to keep up with the genetic resistance. Okay, IPM, that's what it says in the background, integrated pest management. Um, this is something that they will probably ask you on the AP exam, whether it's in an FRQ or you see it in a multiple choice question. But integrated pest management is when we use a variety of techniques to reduce insects and pests on our farm. So we just said that we get caught up in this pesticide treadmill where farmers are just spraying more and more pesticides, changing up to different ones. You're trying to keep up with the resistance. But in order to reduce the amount of pesticides, because we talked about some of the harmful effects of pesticides, um, we would want to try and do a couple of other techniques as well. So you can see cultivation practices here. Um, something that a farmer could do to reduce the amount of pests on their farm would be to do crop rotation, which we just discussed, so changing up the, the crop season to season or year to year. We can have some genetically modified crops, so that's what it means by resistant crop varieties. We talked about the Bt corn, um, how that's genetically modified to produce Bt toxin, and so um, you would oh, be able to use less pesticides. Um, using biological controls or the natural enemies of your pest. I gave you the example of the cottony cushion, which was from Australia, it was introduced to the United States. Entomologists went over to Australia, found um, the predator, they used the Vidalia beetle, and now they're able to help control some of those uh, cottony cushion scales. And pheromone traps, we talked about that. So these are traps that um, are going to use the pheromones of the insects. It's going to either um, attract the insect during the mating season and then trap them, or they can be sprayed in the air and kind of confuses the insects so they don't know like where they're supposed to be going to mate. Um, and just a reminder, pheromones are sexual attractants. And then it says judicious, judicious use of pesticides. So we um, are also going to use some pesticides. Not a lot, not a calendar spray, which means that you spray all the time but we are going to use some amount of pesticide. So using all of these tools together is called integrated pest management. And that's what that is. Um, if you wanted to practice this, because I know everybody in this class wants to be a farmer, um, you would have to accept a low level of economic loss, basically, because you're not going to be able to kill all of the pests. So you're going to have to manage them. And I talked about education. Um, if you're a farmer and you're practicing IPM, you have to be pretty smart. You have to know your pest. You have to know its life cycle. You have to know um, uh, when it reproduces. You have to know its competitors, its predators. So you really have to have a good understanding of your pest. And so that is IPM. Let's see if we go in order after that. Okay. Um, so, also for pesticides, oh, it's asking you for number nine, positives and negatives of pesticides. So, um, for your pesticides, obviously, we need them because they help save our crops. I told you that our biggest competitors like um, on Earth is probably like the insects in the past that try and eat our crops. We're trying to eat them. They're trying to eat them. Um, so it increases crop production, the fact that we make these poisons and we're able to kill them. Um, it also can decrease disease. So vectors like mosquitoes, which carry malaria and also the Zika virus, um, they are killed by 
pesticides. So we discussed DDT, and I've said a million times DDT um, has been banned in highly developed countries. Don't forget Rachel Carson. She was the one who wrote Silent Spring, who brought attention to DDT, and also she explains in her Silent Spring how it thins the eggshells of the, the eagles. So it's an endocrine disruptor. Um, so we used to use some of these pesticides, and, and DDT is banned in the United States, but in many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, they continue to use DDT because it's so effective at killing um, the mosquitoes. And it's cheaper and easier for them to use DDT than it would be for them to uh, start using anti-malarial drugs. So a lot of areas use pesticides in order to protect them from the spread of disease. And you can see on this map here. Oh, here we go again. Sorry, guys. All right. Um, what do we get next? Organic Food Production Act. Um, so this is the Organic Food Production Act, you can see here, of 1990. And um, this was the first law in the United States that uh, made the, the word organic or for, for labeling of organic food to have specific um, characteristics. So not until 1990 did organic on food actually mean something. Before then, people or, or whoever could have put organic on their food and it could have meant anything. So organic. Um, this law said or says that in order for something to be labeled organic, that um, there can be no inorganic fertilizers, um, no pesticides, no genetically modified foods. Um, animals, they must be hormone free, no antibiotics, free range. Um, and so this was, like I said, the first law that made food organic. If you remember, we talked about um, the first organic farm um, in Pennsylvania and Paul and Betty Keene. They were the first people to um, keep their farm basically organic. All right, your old growth forest. Um, we are jumping around, and I truly, truly apologize. Um, this is number 14. So don't forget what the old growth forest is. Um, we talked about this. It's actually in the temperate rainforest in the United States. The largest one. Um, is um, in, the, in the northwest part of the United States. Um, it's also known as a primary or virgin forest, and it has unique features. It's also considered like a climax community, um, and oldest, largest is in Alaska, so Tongass National Forest, um, and you can see some, some things here, some, some indicator species, don't forget that, but basically you need to know where it's located and what it is. So it's an old, old forest. It's never been cut down, known as a virgin, uh, primeval forest. And because it's so old, it has special characteristics. OK, and um, I'm just going to answer the rest of them, since I think I skipped over a few. So continuing on with number 15. It says, list the negative impacts of using antibiotics and hormones for livestock. Um, so we talked about this in our agricultural chapter as well. Um, I told you the main problem with our ant well, the reason why we use antibiotics for our livestock to start out is because it um, is going to reduce the spread of disease. And also by using antibiotics, it can actually make the livestock a little bit plumper and bigger because um, we know that the immune system isn't fighting off disease. So it actually can make it a little bit bigger as well. And the problem with using them, what we're seeing, is antibi antibiotic resistance. So we're seeing that when we take these antibiotics for humans, like when we are sick, that they're not as effective as they used to be. And it's because the bacteria um, are becoming resistant. And hormones for livestock. Um, so hormones are used in order to make them a lot bigger as well. So it makes them nice and plump. Think about that um, chicken breast uh, at Publix versus the organic chicken breast at Publix. Look at the size of that. There's a big difference there. Um, and so a problem with this, um, a lot of countries 
don't use hormones. They refuse to use some of these hormones. Um, some of them are thought to be carcinogenic, so it gives off some carcinogens. We also are concerned that um, by us eating these hormones that it can make maybe young women and, and children develop faster. Um, but really, we haven't been able to link too many harmful effects of it in humans. So uh, the FDA and the World Health Organization, these organ organizations tell us that um, we actually take in more hormones from from other other foods that we eat, like ice cream, than we do from from the amount that's put into our chicken breast, for example. Um, that it's a very small amount that actually makes its way into our bodies. Um, biological control for number se oh number sixteen. I'm kidding. Uh, main reason for the decline in fish since 1990s: uh, overfishing. Like right now, we're dealing with overfishing, uh, bluefin tuna, for instance. We're seeing that the fish stocks are going down very quickly because we are just overfishing. We have better technology nowadays. We are able to track and find schools of fish using sonars, radars, um, and so we are just depleting the ocean of fish. And 17 says define a biological control as an alternative to pesticides and what is the potential risk. Um, we just recently talked about this as well in our pesticide chapter, um, but biological control is when we use the predator of the pest. Uh, a couple of slides ago, I was talking about using the Vidalia be beetle um, to control the cottony cushion scale. Um, so something that can be used but has to be done with care because um, if for some reason that predator of the pest um, has no natural predators here, um, or it reproduces very quickly, itself can become a pest. So that's the concern with that. And I truly apologize for jumping around. Um, and I hope this video helps you. And if you have any questions at all, you can ask me in class. Good night. <laughs>